I salute each and every one with the blessing and the honorable words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you this evening. We welcome you back to T.L. Elliott Ministries. Uh, and in that, I just begin to give the accolades and the atmosphere. What a mighty God that we serve. It's great to be able to come together as a body of believers to press into the word of God. For those that have been on the journey with me in this teaching uh, series of of the book of Revelation. I applaud you for continuing to press in on the course. Uh, for those who may be new and listening, Revelation is the last book of the New Testament, uh, but it is a, a profound and a prolific book. I always like reminding people of the harmony line. First of all, what is Revelation? Amen. We understand as believers, as theologians, or as philosophers, there's two arenas of revelation. There is what we say in time prophecy of things to come. And then we also understand revelation is having things revealed to us. So if we are believers and we're making a declaration that there is a Lord to come to redeem us, then there has to be something revealed to us in order to prepare for that redeeming. Amen. Not just the fact of our lives receiving salvation, but the price being paid in order for us to return to the creator. Amen. So understanding that, let me also say the book of Revelation comes from uh, the Greek word apocalypsis. And if anyone is not aware in the Greek dialect that the book of Revelation is translated from, there's actually two Greek words for revelation. There's what's called apocalypsis and there's what's called apocalypto. Apocalypto is when you have a revelation or something revealed to you in the moment, something new that you learn. Um, but you may not have all the pieces to it. Amen. Many of us encounter something on a day to day basis that was something that we didn't know before. That is what's called an apocalypto. However, an apocalypsis is when you get to the end of the process of everything that there is to be learned about something so that now you have matured or arrived to a level of understanding that you have the ability to turn around and articulate it or demonstrate it to somebody else that begins the same journey or is in the process of a journey where you are now. So in that, I say that because each and every element of the book of Revelation that John the Revelator gives us, he was given us a snippet or, or, or bites of, of things being revealed to him that were apocalyptos to him in the moment. But once everything was done and he was able to complete the book, now it was an apocalypsis because now he's at the end of the story. And here's the thing. Here's the thing that I continue to remind everyone in every Bible study regarding the book of Revelation. You, you can't lose the harmony line of the book. Many people take bits and pieces from the book and began to preach doom and gloom, but I'm here to tell you the book of Revelation is about power and boom. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning this book is the revealing of who Christ is. Amen. Even though I've said this before, I'll continue to say it again, even though the apostles gave the gospels, but the gospels gave the outside of the man. The gospels gave what they were trying to comprehend from their flesh understanding of what a God in the earth was doing. But now John comes to a place that he's given a glimpse of the inside of who Christ is. And you think about it for those who may be married on the line, those who are in relationships uh, with people. People understand usually people before you may uh, marry them, you date them or court them for a period of time in order for you to learn the inside of the person to say, do I want to be uh, uh, in covenant with them or connected to them for a lifetime? 
So in that, watch this, the book of Revelation is telling us not only how to court Jesus, but how to marry him, how to be connected to him for a lifetime, how to uh, uh, what you're getting into to be in in eternity. Amen. It's a hard thing to want to be with somebody for eternity and you don't know them. And see, by this, John is given a profound vision. John is given a profound understanding on the island of Patmos in a place of isolation, i.e., even though many people were looking at John being uh, 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 incarcerated on the island of Patmos, understand for those who are prophetic and not pathetic, we, we, we get a revelation that God usually uses wildernesses in order to isolate you uh, so you can be insulated by him. Sometimes we have to be separated to get into the greatest place of spiritual understanding of some things that God wants us to have. Jesus experienced that when he got baptized in the Jordan and the Holy Spirit descended upon him and he went to the, watch this, wilderness, place of isolation, place of, of loneliness that many would see, but loneliness now gets you comforted by the right spirit when you're going for the right thing. So Jesus did this. Now we have an understanding that John did this. And, you know, I know some are saying, well, Apostle, you're repeating this. And amen. I understand that some things have to be repeated because it needs to be officially engrafted in the minds of believers who will be consistent with going back to the word and seeking the depth of the word so it can be written within them. Amen. So I, I, I say that just to set the tone for those who are not only uh, have been followers of this teaching, but those who may be new voices that are listening right now. Some people need to be set in the right frame of mind. So you approach the book the right way to have the right vision or the prophetic vision to see what it's speaking to you, to your spirit man. Because unless we look at it from the spiritual perspective, we will forever be trapped in our literal understanding and see as long as we stay in literal understanding on spiritual things that's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole you won't be able to 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 make the connection in order to get to the spiritual place that God wants us to be Amen. So now, as I say that tonight, 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 I begin the series uh, still in the book of Revelation. But tonight it begins with chapter 21, chapter 21. But even as I begin to get into chapter 21, for those that have received the Bible study notes, uh, God spoke to my spirit that the title of this chapter is a new heaven and a new earth. New heaven and a new earth. However, in order to transition in chapter 21, if there's some who are listening that were not part of the last Bible study at the closure of chapter 20, I need to speak to some things in chapter 20 in order to transition you tonight. So you know what's going on. Amen. And and in saying that, I got to bring to your remembrance to to really uh, see how profound chapter 21 is about the new heaven and the new earth. You really got to come to grips as to what has just transpired in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. We have a glimpse of what is called the white throne judgment by many in theological arenas. All right. Now, I will say this to break those words down. White throne judgment, white coming from the Greek word leukos, which doesn't just associate itself with the color white that everybody is listening to me and understand out of, out of the Crayola box. What we're talking about is illumination or brightness, light. Okay. Anything uh, in the Greek dialect that is associated with light or illumination, it has always been written out by the word white. OK, so don't take white in its literal sense when we're talking here, white throne judgment. We're talking about an illuminated or clarity or or brightness of the throne of judgment. Now, let me say this throne in Greek is thronos which means seat of power. It's where all the power lies, every dimension of power that God 
put into action, okay? That means it ties itself not only to what we associate is as dunamis power, which is your, your ability to do something, but it also speaks to exousia power, all right, which is the influential power, the thing that is the unseen, the thing that speaks to thought, okay? Then we say judgment. Judgment is, is really the terminology that's understood as separation. When God judges, we're not talking about uh, a, a judge in a, in a, in a uh, courtroom with a jury, a prosecuting attorney, and uh, a, a defending attorney. God's purpose for judgment is for separation, all right? So the white throne judgment is an illuminated place of all the power of God separating right from wrong. Everything that is unrighteous being separated from righteous things. What is profound is at the end of chapter 20, as I mentioned to you here in verse 11 through 15, we see this is the white throne judge and it says, him that sat on it, uh, on the throne from, uh, let me read it and it says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them, meaning they no longer existed. Once you get into the presence of the illumination of the power of God, then nothing else can be seen because it is just so great. Imagine how many of you have taken the time to try to look at the sun. All right. When you try to look at the sun, you can only look at it for so long without sunglasses or, 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 or anything covering your eyes. So imagine a trillion suns at one time shining with so much illumination there is no such thing as darkness existing in its presence so now you can get a real deep revelation of what i'm saying here he says that heaven fled away and there was found no place for them nothing could nothing could even be seen in his presence it says and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which which were written in the books according to their works. Now, what I brought to everybody's attention on the last teaching in the closure of chapter 20 as is what is going on. What I what I clarified based upon this particular verse is those who are before the throne, those who are before the power of God are are being judged or separated based upon watch this their book. See, we have to understand that we are living books just like the written books that we have in the Bible. When you go back and you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, and if I can quickly go there, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, it says, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, Known and read of all men. All right. You are an epistle written in your thoughts. What it says. Verse three. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ. You are manifested physically in the earth realm or in the third dimension. The physical realm to be a living version of a book of Christ. So now you can understand here in Revelations, it says their books were open. Those who were standing before him, everybody is a novel. Everybody is a novel unto God because Christ is a novel. That's why he was called the Logos, the living word. If he's a living word, he's not only a spoken word, he's a recorded word. He's an eternal word. He is something that 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 can be uh, uh, read about and learned about and imparted within us as individuals. So as we begin to understand what's really transpired here in the book of Revelation, it says that we are... Our epistle or our book is made open and is compared to the master book because it says another book was open, which was the book of life. And you or they were judged according to their works. Now, let me let me say this again, because somebody may be new listening. Understand works ain't what you do for people. Works is what you make is your profession for the kingdom. Let me say this again. Works is not what you do, i.e. as a favor or a kind act. 
works according to the word of God is about your profession. So it says your novel tells your profession. And what happens is Jesus's novel, the book of life, tells what the standard of profession is. So what happens is the job description of him is being compared to your resume. That's a book that is now before him because now he's seeing is your pages worth keeping as a relic or is your pages worth throwing in the bonfire. Now what happens, we understand here by the scriptures uh, in the closure of Revelation, he says uh, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. De death and hell were cast into the fire and those whose names, i.e. their character, was not written in the book of life was cast into the same fire. Now keep in mind, this is fire without brimstone, without medication or without purification occurring in order to uh, 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 purify what is left over in the process of extrapolating what's not pure. OK, this is what this is what is transpired. So so now watch this. Watch this. Now we can transition to chapter 21 because now you begin to understand God does some new things. But yet some old things can't linger. Remember, Jesus made the comment, you can't put new wine in old skins. OK, so so God still binding himself to his own word. What was even declared by Christ that was spoken that some people, you know, may may have looked at that from from one perspective of revelation based on the metaphor that's given. Now it begins to speak in a greater level for you to understand here in the book of Revelation, where he says now in Revelation chapter 21, verse one. The scripture reads as thus, it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Let me take some, some time to begin to dissect this and give you some real revelation, some clarity on this. Notice once again, the last portion of Revelation 20 deals with Everything that is unclean, everything that is not like God, everything that has refused God, everything that doesn't match the identity of Christ has now been eliminated in the lake of fire. Meaning now it's burnt for an eternity because those things can't linger over into a new thing that God is getting ready to do. Think about this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of times when people transition from one house to another, especially when people move from an older house to a brand new house. Notice that many people have the mindset that they will prefer to buy new furniture to put it in the new house. Now, I'm not saying people don't bring some of their furniture from their old house to the new house, but understand where you get the mindset of that. You want new carpet in a new house. You want new furniture in a new house. If you have if you have the finances uh, uh, to do it. You replace everything and then you begin to throw away old stuff or you sell old stuff because you try to pass away old memories and you try to establish a new look and a new memory based on new stuff. OK, so so what happens is God says, I, I'm not looking to bring some things over into the new heaven and the new earth that I'm establishing. Those things need to be done away in order for me to bring you into something that I have purified and I've clarified that is now a, a, a new thing. Now, in this, with it being a new thing, watch this, I need to clarify something to you as well. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. John, first of all, 
the, the word, as he says, I saw is the Greek word Ido, which means to see, but it also doesn't limit itself to his visual sight. It also speaks to his discernment. It, 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 it speaks to his spiritual perception. So even though he's seeing something, he's also discerning or deciphering it in his spirit that it is more than what his physical eyes can tell. So in that, he says, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you've got to understand something here. I need I need to clarify what new is. Because many of us will 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 think new here is something brand new. But I need to clarify it to you. There's two Greek words for new. All right. The first Greek word for new is neos. Spelt neos. Neos is in respect to age i.e. something born or created from nothing meaning brand new you know what i'm saying you may have a new baby it came uh from the womb but in a matter of speaking we could say it came from nowhere to somewhere into the physical reality Okay, it's brand new. Or if you were creating something from scratch, you make something new. So it is the Greek term neos. All right. The second Greek term, though, is kainos. K-A-I-N-O-S. Kainos means fresh or unused. Or if I can really say restored. It means cosmetic restoration to to uh, improve or fix. Okay, let me clarify this to you now. If I had a house and the roof gets damaged, I don't demolition the house in order to fix the roof. What I do do is cosmetic work by just replacing the roof okay that is an illustration of what kainos is it's not taking uh something from nothing and creating it it is talking about a cosmetic work or a restoration work you know what i'm saying just like people will take old furniture and they'll sand it down and they'll put varnish or they'll put shellac on it so all they've done is some cosmetic or some restoration to the furniture so watch this believe it or not here in revelation chapter 21 verse 1 when he said a new heaven and a new earth he's not talking about creating a brand new one he's talking about doing cosmetic work to the ones already in existence the word new that's used here is kainos not neos hear what i'm saying it's kainos not neos okay so what he is saying john said I saw a new heaven and a new earth, meaning he saw God do a cosmetic work to fix the one that's broken. Now he fixed or cleaned up this earth. He fixed or cleaned up the heavens or the universe where unrighteousness and demonic uh, uh, entities have existed. Okay, because some people have to put the common sense factor. If God uh, was going to do away with this earth, then where would you go? Would you levitate above the earth until he poof, put a new one in place and then say, okay, I'll put you back down. No, no. You, You understand in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah even said the Lord would never bring the earth to a full end. Let me me say that again. Isaiah prophesied this in the Old Testament. He said uh, God would never bring the earth to a full end. And the reason he won't bring it to a full end is because he's only going to cosmetically fix what's already in existence. All right. Because everything he created was not only good, but it was very good. All right. It just became polluted by what was in it. Now that you now that you got some some understanding. So he says, I saw a new heaven. All right. And as we understand the word heaven, the Greek word is oranos or oranos, 
which means sky, space, uh, the dwelling place of God, and also means universe. All right. So he created a new heaven, or he cosmetically fixed heaven. He cosmetically fixed the earth or the land. Then there's a colon in the verse. It says the reason he done this is because the first and the and uh, the first heaven and uh, the first earth were passed away. All right. What is he saying that they were passed away? Other than the fact is he was speaking to their neglect. All right. When when we say pass away, all right. The word pass away is from parakomai, which means to go by, to perish or neglect, due to man being out of position of being in the God identity. Man neglected his responsibility of first fivefold ministry that's referenced in Genesis one twenty eight. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion over the earth. That was man's first responsibility given to him by God while he was still in the God-man identity. But when sin came into the picture, man began to neglect his responsibility as a God-man and began to operate as a earthbound man. All right. As the scripture talks about in Genesis, when Adam named his son Enos, which means mortal man, man became totally mortal or humanistic in his characteristics of his responsibility of keeping the earth the way that God uh, had designed him or giving him the authority to do. So now that he uh has neglected the responsibility. Now he's been diverted in mindset. Those things began to pass away based upon the judgment of things that had just transpired. Because if you remember, even when we talked about in the previous chapters of the book of Revelation, we got into uh, the seven seals and the seven bold judgments. And those things were, were judgment or separations that were impacting the universe. Stars falling, moon not showing its light. Uh, 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 or, 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 or turning into blood. We began to see uh, the waters turn as blood. We began to see everything happen to the environment. So the environment, due to the pollution of sin, even impacting the earth, it went through a transformation or a metamorphosis. God was judging it or separating it in order for it to be the, the, the newly fixed earth. Same thing with the heavens. Some of the stars had to fall. Some of the heavenly heavenly hosts had to come out of their position in order for God to allow a new thing or a cosmetic thing to happen in the heavenlies. OK, so so in that we we now begin to really understand what, what what's being said here. He says uh, for he the first heaven and the first earth were passed away or neglected and there was no more sea. All right. Meaning there was no more man to deal with. Because one thing that we, we looked at here in the book of Revelation, we noticed that when it talked about sea, when it talked about water, it was a metaphor for many people, nations and tongues. Just like in chapter 20, it said the sea gave up the dead, meaning a uh, 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 people, uh, uh, those who were living, gave up those who were spiritually dead among them. We're not talking about the Atlantic Ocean. We're not talking about the Pacific. We're not talking about the sea and the lakes that man uh, knows by different names. We're talking about people. So now notice that he said those whose names were not written in the book in chapter 21, they're thrown in the, in, uh, the lake of fire. So now there is no more people, i.e. no more sea. We're not talking about those who have been delivered because remember at the beginning of the chapter, beginning of chapter 20, we saw those who had been redeemed. All right. And they reign and rule with Christ for a thousand years. All right. But they're in a transformed existence. All right. So don't get that confused. Understand what, what we're saying here. The sea was just people. Well, those those that had no real investment or covenant in God. So now it brings me to verse two. Verse two. It says, 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. All right. So the scripture says now, now, now John says, after I see the new heaven and the new earth, after I see heaven has been fixed, I see earth has been fixed. Now it is conducive to the city of God. Now it is, it is, uh, uh, capable of sustaining the kingdom. Now it is in the posture that it can withstand the presence of the kingdom of God in it. See right now, you know, we look to be the bride. All right. We've got to be prepped in order for the groom to come. So in the same turn, just like we got to be prepped, the earth got to be prepped for his presence as well. Y'all, y'all, y'all got to understand this. Even, even, even if the president was coming to town, notice that there's some preparations that security does in advance to prepare for his presence. He just don't pop up on the scene like underdog. Dun, 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 dun. He's right here and nobody has done any preparation. So just as much as people got to be prepared, uh, the environment has to be prepared as well. So John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And, and in that, watch this. Remember, the word holy is, is hagias, which means consecrated. All right? It's, it's separated. It's not any old type of city. Y'all got to get what I'm saying. It can't be compared to anything else because this city had to pay a price. This city uh, 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 had to go through something to have its identity of being holy. You know what I'm saying? Just like we talk about saints. Saints aren't born saints. Saints are made saints based upon the process or the purpose that they go through, i.e. the price that they pay in order to give their life or dedicate themselves unto God. This is what makes them holy. This is what makes them consecrated unto God because God recognizes their consecration process. So, so the city, the city, it says, is a holy city. The word city itself uh, uh, comes from the Greek word polis, which means citadel or town or, 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 or a, a population of people, i.e. we're understanding as the kingdom, the spiritual realm of dominion of those who are collective uh, on God's behalf. So it says the city the new Jerusalem, once again, word new that's used uh, uh, here, uh, uh, new Jerusalem is Herosalam, which means set you double peace. Okay, now some people may not understand what I just said, set you double peace in the meaning. All right. What we're referring to is the fact of, you know, as, as, as some people look into, um, the scientific thinking, uh, hermetic thinking as it is above. So it is below. So what that speaks to, as it says, double peace, the Jerusalem of the heavens as the Jerusalem of earth to become one. All right. So it's speaking of a heavenly Jerusalem that now comes to the well based upon an earthly Jerusalem. So we see Jerusalem descending. All right. From the heavens, it comes down. Uh, not just from heaven, but watch this. It says it comes down from God out of heaven. All right. So in that it comes from the throne or the presence of God through the universe. All right. Now, reason, reason I, I emphasize that, uh, I was just refreshing some things here and it talks about when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the father, it says that he did, he ascended above above the heavens all right a lot of people have have we looked 
look closer at that, but it says he descended above the heavens. So that means he, he, he ascended above the universe. So he not only went into the universe, but he went beyond the universe. The throne of God is beyond what we can even contain as the universe. It is, it is beyond it both physically and it's also beyond it both dimensionally. All right. So, so in that this city comes out of another dimension, out of another realm through the universe in order to come here. All right. Now it says, uh, um, it comes from God out of heaven, out of the universe, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, let, let me touch that. When the scripture says that this, this Jerusalem is prepared, all right, it's, it, 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 it's implying to make ready or, or prepare or to provide for. All right, so... This city has been provided for, not only in its existence coming here, God prepared the way or the portal for it to get here, and God prepared the destination that it's coming to. Remember, once again, chapter 20 was a judgment not only for man, but it also dealt with uh, previously in the other chapters, a judgment upon the earth for the earth's purging, which John now acknowledges in the first verse so that the earth is prepared, i.e. it has already been made conducive to receive the presence of the holy, holy city. So it descends. Uh as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, uh, when we say as a bride, we're talking about uh, as a wife or a woman that is prepared to be married to her husband or to complete the marriage ceremony. If any of you who are not familiar with, with Jewish or Hebraic culture, there's, there's two ceremonies when it comes to marriage. There's a pre-ceremony uh, that the man selects the bride, and then the man goes back, he prepares his home where his father is, which is his mansion. He makes rooms or extensions on his father's mansion for his bride to come live at, when he goes and receives her to complete the ceremony. What happens is once he makes the extension on his father's house at his father's permission, because some, some of y'all should be really thinking when you go back and look at John, I think it's John chapter 14. He says in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. So he goes back based upon the Jewish custom to prepare the living space for those who are going to be married to him in the father's house to become part owner of that mansion. Once it's prepared, the son waits on the father to send him or dispatch him to go get his bride to do the second part of the marriage ceremony, i.e. to consummate their marriage, their union. To complete the covenant, okay? Because in the process, while the groom is gone to prepare for the bride, what is supposed to be happening is the bride is learning how to be a wife. That's what the church, somebody should really get a revelation, what I'm saying right now. He is gone to prepare a place for us, i.e. the new Jerusalem to descend. And in the process of him being gone and us waiting for him to return, we supposed to be learning how to get married to him. We are supposed to be learning not how to shack up with the anointing, but to marry the anointing, which is why we're getting this with the book of Revelation. We are supposed to be now understanding this on a revelatory level in order to prepare us for when he returns so we can act like we married to him. So in that, the text says, he says, prepared as a bride, adorned 
for her husband. Watch this. Now, that is uh, something significant that I believe a lot of people hasn't, hasn't put a lot of weight to. What is adorning? Let, let me, I, I'm posing a question that I'm going to give you the answer, but I, I have to take a moment to let you think about that. What is adorning? It says here in the scriptures, let me read it again. He says, and I, uh, uh, he says, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now, let me give you something that's profound. The word adorn is cosmeo in Greek. It means to put in order. All right. It means to prepare or it means to make ready, but it's something being prepared or made ready by being put in order. All right. Understand as far as order is concerned with God, order is peace and peace is order, which is something that speaks uh, profoundly when it when it comes to Christ, because he's the one that has done the work. The groom is the one doing or has done the work, because remember, uh, the scripture calls him wonderful counselor, prince of peace or chief over order. All right. So if I receive him, if I begin to have my marriage ceremony with him being the bride to me, regardless of of uh, uh, my genealogy, regardless of uh, uh, if I'm male or female, the thing is now I am saying I want to be married to you or connected to you, Christ, for eternity. So he says, OK, then my responsibility to you is not only to prepare a thing for you. I'm going to do you the courtesy of not only going to prepare a place for you, but I'm also going to dwell in your life to help you get in order. So when I come for you, you're already in order in order to be uh, received by my father. See, a lot of people don't want to have Christ in the picture. And if we don't want to have Christ in the picture, we don't want to have Jesus. We don't want to have Yeshua in the picture. Then we miss the piece of order because he's the chief over order that we need in order to be in order so that the father sees us in order to receive us in the house. So in the descending of the city, he says, these are those who were willing to let me put their life in order. These were those who were willing to receive eternal life because I ordered their life based upon mine. When they were compared to me, their life or their epistle was based on the order that I lived or the order that I set for them to live by. Not only by the Gospels, but even as they get the revelation of who I am through the book of Revelation of telling uh, 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 the sequence of order of my own life that now can speak to theirs that they can begin to use as a blueprint to prepare themselves as brides unto me. In saying that, in saying that, he says, a bride adorned for her husband. And once again, as I say, husband, it means uh, 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 not only a male, but an individual male or an individual man. So in that, he says, watch this. I have prepared you as a bride and ordered you. So that you are not out of order because of being uh, adulterers spiritually. All right. Because as we understand in the physical, what adultery is uh, or fornication, uh, being involved with multiple people of the opposite sex or even some uh, being involved with people of the same sex. What he says is the order that you establish is about being committed to one. All right. Jesus said, I am the father of one. So there is something about commitment unto God that that 
helps establish the covenant of the vow that we are to have with him. So in that he wants us to be committed solely to him. We're looking for only one God to be married to, not numerous gods. We're not looking for pantheons. All right. We, we, we are looking for, for a, a, a monotheism, one God. All right. One, one form of divinity that we marry ourselves to. In that, let, let me read verse three. He says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So, so in this, watch this. He says now that the city, that the kingdom now has come out of a dimension that is now within this dimension and this realm. He says, I heard John says, not only did he discern, but now he says his spiritual hearing is being activated with his spiritual sight of discernment. He begins to line those things up in verse two and verse three. And he says, I heard a great voice, meaning an important voice or an important tongue, an important language or an important frequency. All right. So he's saying the frequency of God was significant enough that it got his attention, both hearing and seeing. And then he says the voice came out of heaven or it came from out of the universe or through the universe saying or speaking speaking behold so so in that the first thing he says is i need everyone that hears the sound of my voice or the frequency in the heavens that's being spoken right now i need you to convert yourself to spiritual sight because when you're told to behold it's not just to look at a thing but it's also for you to activate discernment as to what you're looking at and based upon who's speaking to you it dictates what realm of discernment you are supposed to be operating in so what the scripture declares is that the heavens is speaking for you to see in heavenly ways in spiritual ways to understand what's about to happen he says behold the tabernacle of God is with men. And when we say this thing, tabernacle, uh, the word tabernacle is skene in Greek, which means tent or habitation. So it says the habitation of God is with men, i.e. human beings, and he will dwell with them, i.e. encamp himself with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So he says, when I dwell, when I dwell with you, you now are my people, and I am your God. See, in the outer dimensions, it's a tough thing for flesh. The physical, and I'm not talking about our, our, our human characters, I'm talking about these bodies. In this dimension, this is the third dimension, which is the physical, where we see, see and uh, touch objects and so forth. So he says, breaking forth into this realm, now I coexist with human beings or with bodies that have been transformed uh, uh, for the sole purpose of me. That now there is no separation man from me or me from man. Now, the thing is, you got to understand, as the scripture says, behold, there was something significant and profound about what I gave you with him saying, behold, now uh, God dwells with man in the earth. And it's because in previous time before this, we didn't have the discernment or the sight to recognize his co-dwelling. It's made profound here, but see, before we were blind to co-dwelling. Why do I say that? It's because something that Paul said that is very uh, significant. If you remember, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and I'm, I'm turning there very quickly because I know time has gotten away from us. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16, Paul says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. So while we're still fighting 
with sin, while we're still fighting with our human nature, while we're still in our unconverted form, while we're still in a place before God makes a new heaven and a new earth, the God of this world has blinded us. He's blinded us from seeing and knowing who we are. And he's also blinded us uh, from seeing and knowing who's within us. So in that bit that he's blinded us from the Holy Spirit and the spirit of God that dwells in each and every one of us. That's why Paul has to pose the question. Did you not know that your temple, that your body is the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Paul doesn't just say it there. Paul turns around and says it again in chapter six, in chapter six, verse 19. He says, what is it's it's like he's discombobulated. He's amazed that we ain't came to the revelation he says what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own because be it that we're blinded by the god of this world be it that we're blinded by satan or the characteristic of the adversary we can't see who we are so once the metamorphosis has happened with the new heaven and the new earth, once the removal of those who would not live according to the Holy Spirit and, 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 and the laws of God and the nature of Christ, now those who remain, he says, now I speak through the universe to come to a, a place for you to be in a place of an awakening that now I want you to see something, but don't see it with natural eyes, even though you're in a natural realm, I want you to see it with spiritual eyes. And now you can see what Paul asked the question that you couldn't see before. Now you are in a place that you're not only in a new heaven and a new earth. You're not only in, in the vicinity of the kingdom of God of dwelling. You now are the kingdom of God. You didn't even see your transition that was occurring, which now comes to pass. So so now he says, now you have been granted the ability to recognize who you are in me and not only who you are in me, but who, who, who I am in you. Now we forever bond. We forever come into covenant with each other. All right. Uh, so that's why he says he will be our God. He will be our God. Amen, amen, and amen to God be the glory.